He was born to fight, raised to accept nothing less than victory on the battlefield. He is the great military commander from Carthage, Hannibal. Hannibal's lifelong mission, destroy Rome or die trying. Hannibal battles his way across the frozen Alps, bloodies the ground with tens of thousands of Rome's fiercest warriors, and makes military history on a battlefield where he slaughters 70,000 men in one day. Hannibal is a killer. Hannibal is a conqueror. Hannibal is the Annihilator. The year 219 BC, the man, Hannibal Barca of Carthage, one of history's greatest and deadliest generals. Hannibal burns the Roman town of Saguntum to the ground. These smoldering flames are just the initial sparks of the raging inferno that will soon engulf Europe as Hannibal the Annihilator launches a bloody reign of vengeance aimed to crush mighty Rome. Hannibal's home of Carthage is a commercial beacon on the northern coast of Africa. Their trade and military influence reverberates throughout the Mediterranean. They traded far and wide, as far off to the eastern Mediterranean. There's even some evidence that they traded as far west through the Straits of Gibraltar uh, to England. 400 short miles from Carthage is Rome. Though not yet the colossal empire they will become, their military might threatens Carthaginian commercial dominance in the region. The Romans are very much a warlike imperial people. They're not an empire yet, but you could definitely see this republic starting to expand its borders. It was only a matter of time before Rome and Carthage bumped into one another. Hannibal's personal and brutal destruction of Saguntum is a bloody invitation, hand-delivered to Rome, inviting them to join his deadly game of butchery and annihilation. The siege of Saguntum uh, lasted eight months, as far as we know. Uh, pretty much lacking in detail from a historical perspective. What we do know, however, is that once uh, the walls were breached and Carthaginian troops went in, they went house to house and uh, hunted down almost all of the Roman families, killed the Roman males, and so sold the uh, women and other and children into, into slavery. Through the smoke and stench of scorched earth and torched Roman corpses comes Rome's response. Capture Hannibal and crucify him. It's a very famous scene by the Greek historian Polybius, where the Roman ambassador grabs his toga, a fold in each hand, and says, Rome offers you peace or war. Choose. It matters not to Rome. Hannibal and the Carthaginians gladly choose to fight. It is war, the seeds of which were planted nearly half a century earlier. Then, Carthage and Rome bloodied the Mediterranean Sea in what is called the First Punic War, named for the Latin term for Carthage, Punica. 400,000 casualties, almost 15% of the military manpower of the entire country of Italy was lost in that war. It was a terribly bloody war. The war eventually ends in a military draw, but for Carthage, the peace treaty is especially costly. Part of the deal they make with Rome is that Carthage will limit their navy to 100 ships. This is pretty crippling to an empire that was a naval and commercial trading power. With most of their commercial fleet gone and their pockets empty, Carthage uses its military power to exploit the riches of Spain. Turns out that Spain's got vast silver mines, and the Carthaginians quickly gain a hold on them and amass a fortune. They decide to build up their land defenses instead of their navy, which had been pretty much depleted in the First Punic War. Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barca, one of Carthage's most accomplished and battle-hardened men, leads the army into Spain. Now, Hamilcar Barca is the founder of a great military dynasty uh, in Carthage called the Barsids, after the name Barca. 
and he really hated the Romans. Young Hannibal is immersed in a violent and bloody world as he watches his father, teacher, and role model engage in fiercely brutal combat. Hannibal is only nine when Hamilcar takes over Spain, so he essentially grows up on the battlefield. Hamilcar provides young Hannibal with a hands-on education in brutality and warfare. So by the time he's 19, he's been, his whole life, has been in a military camp. And here he watches his father and other general officers and learns how to, how to command men. Hannibal learns that to build an army of loyal fighters willing to march by his side into the horrors of war, he must sometimes punish his own. If a Carthaginian officer fails in battle, he is crucified in the public square. Carthaginian rule in Spain is downright cruel. It's based on fire, sword, and crucifixion. But Hannibal also motivates his men by sleeping where they sleep, eating what they eat, and fighting where they fight. They obediently follow his words, his sword, and his deep-seated desire for revenge against Rome, which he inherits from his father. But Hamilcar will never taste revenge. In 228 BC, he dies suddenly, some say assassinated. His place is taken by his son-in-law, called Hasdrubal the, the Splendid, uh, who continues on again for about another six years, building Carthaginian power, increasing its, its scope. Uh, and then finally, he's assassinated too. Uh, and there's some question historically of whether or not Hannibal had a hand in this. It is finally Hannibal's hour. He's only 26 years old, but commands the entire Carthaginian army. But he is fierce, battle-tested, and driven. Legend has it that Hamilcar made the young Hannibal swear an oath on the altar of Baal that he would spend his life in opposing and then ultimately destroying Rome. In 219 BC, with his father's hunger for revenge burning inside him and with Saguntum aflame, Hannibal launches his attack against Rome. The Second Punic War is on. Hannibal amasses a strike force of about 50,000 soldiers. But because he has no navy, he's got to invade Italy by land. Hannibal's on the move. From Spain, he leads his fighting force of about 50,000 north along the Mediterranean coast toward Rome. A grueling two and a half months later, an exhausted but battle-ready Hannibal reaches the Rhone River. But Hannibal is shocked to discover the Romans had caught wind of the advance and launched a strike force to intercept. The Romans had caught wind of Hannibal's movements in Spain. But instead of heading directly to Spain, they were smart. They looked at a map, figured out where Hannibal was going to march, and tried to block the land route to the Italian peninsula on the coast of the Mediterranean. It is the great military Roman general Publius Cornelius Scipio who leads the attack against Hannibal. Scipio's force, 10,000 men strong, is in Massilia, a Roman ally on the Mediterranean coast. Hannibal's force, five times as large, has crossed the Rhone River. Scipio sends 300 of his cavalry up the Rhone to find Hannibal. Hannibal orders 500 cavalry to scout the Roman advance. The two reconnaissance units collide. War between Rome and Carthage rages once again. This is a small skirmish between scouting parties. In this particular skirmish, Hannibal's forces take the brunt of the attack and then retreat. Scipio orders his entire force to follow. Hannibal knows Scipio is only a few days' march away, and Scipio is a talented commander. He should be able to give Hannibal a run for his money. But when Scipio arrives at the location where Hannibal's army should be, they're gone. It's as if Hannibal's whole army has vanished into thin air. Scipio forced Hannibal to change his plan. Now, instead of marching along the Mediterranean coast to Rome, Hannibal's attack will come from the north through the Alps. The reason why Hannibal came by land through Spain and over the Alps was not because it was a great strategic choice. It was, in fact, the route that was forced upon him by, uh, essentially, uh, Roman, Roman events, by the situation he confronted at the time. Hannibal reaches the Alps in autumn of 218 BC. At this altitude, he and his 50,000 soldiers face freezing temperatures and treacherous ice on a narrow, rocky terrain. The men are hungry, 
Their supplies are limited, and he's leading more than just infantry. He's also leading 9,000 cavalry and 37 elephants. All the major armies had a few elephants in them. When the Greeks fought Carthage in one of their little skirmishes, the Carthaginians used to have chariots, and they were driven from the battlefield by the elephants, at which point they said, let's get rid of the chariots and replace them with elephants. And so as a consequence, by the time of the Punic War, uh, Carthage has, in her home, just in her, her home uh, base, she has 300 trained elephants living in the walls of the city of, of Carthage. Uh, so that, that's how you, you get the elephant introduced in warfare. The crossing of the Alps with such a large force is a difficult military feat. For Hannibal and his army, it has horrific consequences. Men freeze, men starve. At one point, a landslide completely blocks their way. It's absolutely hellish. Supplies are even running low, and they're not even to the most difficult part of the crossing yet. Well, they happen upon this Gallic village where the Gauls offer provisions and supplies. Hannibal accepts the help, but he definitely is suspicious of their motives because he knows that sometimes the Gauls are friendly and sometimes they are not. Hannibal doesn't fully trust the Gauls, but eventually accepts their help. The Gauls direct Hannibal to a narrow pass which leads to a gorge. Hannibal's original suspicions were right on. The guides suddenly bolt. It's a trap. Two eighteen BC, Hannibal leads his Carthaginian army over the treacherous Alps to invade Rome. Along the way, marauding Gauls ambush Hannibal with a barrage of boulders and arrow fire. Hannibal encounters different tribes throughout his campaign. They were mainly Gauls. This is a tribal people who lived in, in what's now modern-day France. They're not, they're not a unified people and usually don't ally themselves against a common enemy. So sometimes they'll join his war on Rome, and other times they'll attack him. In this case, the Gauls are out for blood. The gorge turns into a gauntlet of death. Gauls block both ends of the gorge, but Hannibal's troops fight their way out, leaving the butchered enemy in their wake. After some 30 grueling days, Hannibal and his men emerge from the Alps. When they finally arrive on the northern plains of Italy, nearly a third of Hannibal's army has perished. They lose about 18,000 infantry, about a third of the cavalry, which would be maybe 4,000 horse, uh, and uh, you know, we arrive with, say, 27 elephants, you lose a third of the elephants. But Hannibal has always known the crossing would be costly. From the very beginning of the war, he's had a plan to replenish his forces, a plan that relied on his elephants. Part of Hannibal's strategy in crossing the Alps was that he understood that he didn't have enough manpower to fight the Romans. Therefore, he would have to acquire it once he got into Italy. How was he going to do that? He was going to do that by uh, attracting to his, uh, his standard the Gauls, the Celts and Gauls, who hated the Romans because they'd been fighting one another for 500 years, and hopefully as well get some uh, Roman allied states to defect. Uh, so the reason for bringing the 37 elephants uh, over the Alps was really to impress uh, in a political sense, both the Gauls and the Allied states, that this was a serious army. Hannibal's elephants thunder into northern Italy. They successfully lure Gallic tribes to the Carthaginian side. By November 218 BC, Hannibal's numbers swell to nearly 40,000. Rome answers with 40,000 of its own soldiers to face Hannibal's threat. Both armies are now on a collision course that will rock the ancient world and rewrite military history. The armies of Carthage and Rome couldn't be more different. Hannibal's men are mercenary soldiers from all over the map. Hannibal's army is from different parts of the region, many of them mercenaries, drawn to his legendary leadership in battle. The light infantry are from Libya. These men carry a small round shield and fight with a small sword or javelin. Heavy infantry are warriors from Gaul, men who run into battle naked. 
intimidating their enemies with their deadly two-handed broadswords. Heavy cavalry is from Spain and northern Europe. Their weapon of choice is either a bowed sword called a falcata or a deadly longsword. Hannibal's ability to orchestrate these different types of forces in a coordinated attack is what makes him truly a remarkable general. The Roman army is much different than Hannibal's forces. Where the Carthaginians are very diverse, the Romans are quite uniform. Roman soldiers are ablaze in armor. Bronze helmets protect their heads. Chain mail or brass breastplates defend their bodies. Each soldier carries one of history's deadliest throwing spears, the pilum. That long metal rod was made of soft metal with a hook. When it went through the shield, the weight of the wooden body would bend it. You couldn't take the pilum out of the shield. Now the enemy had a choice of fighting with a shield with a spear stuck into it, or what they foolishly did very often is simply throw the shield away. Not a good move against Roman infantry. Slaughter also comes in the form of a straight sword forged of iron, ideal for up close and personal combat. Their scutum shield provides almost complete protection from missile attacks. While Hannibal's army is cobbled together, his opponent is a much more cohesive fighting force. The Roman army was a true national army. They all spoke the same language, they all had the same equipment, and they were all trained to the same tactics. But the most significant difference is their style of battle. So you have this Roman force of highly disciplined citizen soldiers equipped and trained to go straight at the enemy against a group of professionals that can hit you in any number of ways. At the Ticinus River, these radically different fighting styles clash in a hurricane of violence. Hannibal's light cavalry surround the Romans, slash at the Roman cavalry, then back off, then re-attack. It's chaos and confusion, not what the Romans are used to. The blood of 2,000 slain Roman soldiers drenches the ground. It is a shocking defeat. The key point about the little skirmish at the Ticinus River was that uh, Publius Scipio was wounded. The Romans replaced Scipio with General Sempronius Longus, a strong leader with an even stronger temper. Sempronius is a hothead. He's desperate for glory, and his one-year term as army commander is almost up. He's champing at the bit to fight, and Hannibal knows it. Some evidence of, of Hannibal's brilliance as a military commander was the fact that he studied his adversaries closely. Now, where he got this information isn't clear. Uh, surely the number of, of uh, Roman commanders was relatively small, and so they would have been well known. But also my guess is that the uh, uh, truly excellent Carthaginian intelligence may have been at work here. So that whenever he was prepared for battle, he knew who was in command on the other side, and he studied him closely, knew for his strengths and weaknesses. And in the case of Sempronius, he knew Sempronius well. He knew he was a hothead, and he played him like a fiddle. The two enemy armies camp on opposite sides of the Trebia River, about 70 short yards apart. It's not much of an obstacle in a physical sense, but uh, it can become an obstacle when you realize that if you have to cross it, it's November, it's gray, and it's snowing. And so that's going to be any army that tries to cross that river under those conditions is going to suffer somewhat. Hannibal's strategy? Take advantage of the frigid temperatures, the Roman commander's fiery temper, and use the element of surprise. He sends two or 3,000 cavalry in the early morning dawn across the river to attack the Roman camp. The Romans are shocked awake. They stumble around the cold with no food. The Roman general Sempronius is furious. He orders the men to cross the river and attack. So they plunge into the icy water to chase Hannibal's men. Not the best way to start your day. 40,000 Roman infantry and 4,000 cavalry cross the river. They line up for battle in a formation called a legio, made up of several maniples. Maniple literally means a handful of men. Each maniple consists of about 120 soldiers. The Romans arrange themselves in a checkerboard configuration. 
This is a force specifically designed to move forward and crush its enemy. But Hannibal has his own crushing machines, pachyderms, the heavy tanks of the Carthaginian army. They charge at the flanks of the Roman cavalry. Nearly impervious to spears, the elephant's earth-shaking assault scatters the allied horsemen in sheer terror. Hannibal's cavalry, 10,000 strong, far outnumbers the Romans. His Numidian cavalry is so fast and agile that they appear to be everywhere at once. Hannibal's heavy Spanish and Celtic cavalry slam with such force, they demolish what's left of the Roman cavalry. Hannibal's Carthaginian cavalry turns inward and smashes the Roman flanks. Hannibal surrounds the Romans on three sides, but he is not done yet. Hannibal has just crossed the Trebia River and has a bloody surprise for the Roman army. Using specially trained horses, Hannibal has successfully hidden cavalry in the tall grass. Trumpet blast and an elite Carthaginian cavalry force charges from the swamp. The Romans turn around to see 2,000 horses storm up from behind. It must have been absolutely terrifying. The Carthaginian cavalry blindsides the Romans, who are then pushed back toward the river and cut down mercilessly. Of the 40,000 men, Roman and allied, that took the field that day, 30,000 died. 30,000 met their deaths on the bank of the Trebia River. It was the worst defeat that the Romans had suffered since the defeat against the Gauls 125 years earlier. The Battle of the Trebia is an absolutely classic example of how to use tactical surprise at a key moment in the battle. And the result was complete slaughter. Hannibal does suffer losses at Trebia. All but one of his elephants die of starvation or exhaustion. He rides the lone survivor named Ceres. The horror of Trebia spurs the Roman Senate to raise four new legions, 20,000 men. Rome also appoints two new consuls to lead the men into battle, Gnaeus Servilius Geminus and Gaius Flaminius. Their target, Hannibal. Their mission, seek and destroy. In the spring of 217 BC, the Romans decide that the best way to block Hannibal's advance southward is to divide their forces. Geminus travels northeast to coastal Ariminus. Flaminius heads northwest to Aretium, but they leave a southern route open through the marshes of the lower Arno River Valley. Now, the Arno marshes were an enormously large, uh, swampy area uh, created by the Arno River. I mean, it's full of muck, uh, insects, uh, snakes. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible natural barrier, so much so that neither of the Roman commanders blocking the roads on either side thought anyone would be crazy enough to try to march through uh, these, these marshes. Well, Hannibal is known for doing the unexpected, and don't you know, he tries to penetrate uh, these marshes. The surprise maneuver does prove costly for Hannibal. While riding atop Sirius, his last remaining elephant, Hannibal is supposedly stung in the eye by an insect. He gets infected, and he becomes blind in that eye. But Hannibal remains unstoppable. He slips through the two Roman forces and arrives at Tuscany, a Roman ally, and torches the landscape. Hannibal starts burning the Tuscan plain. Houses, towns, uh, slaughtering animals, uh, chopping down trees. Hannibal's plan, destroy the area and infuriate the Roman general Flaminius, who watches the devastation from the city walls of Aretium. And Flaminius is just horrified by it. He's horrified not only so much that this area is being destroyed, but he knows what Hannibal is doing. Instead of attacking Flaminius inside the city walls, Hannibal is sending a message to other Roman allies. And what Hannibal is saying to that ally is, if you stay with Rome, this is what you can expect. He's trying to woo that ally away. And, and Flaminius also knows that it's a sign of Roman weakness that you cannot stop this. Hannibal knows his enemy well 
and wants to lure Flaminius onto the battlefield. Why? That's his plan. Destroy as many Roman armies, kill as many Romans as you can until the Roman Senate tires of war and sues for peace. You can't do that with siege warfare. You've got to draw the enemy out into battle. Hannibal continues to taunt Flaminius by marching his army right past the walls of Aretium, flaunting his courage and power. Hannibal is just far enough away to tease Flaminius. He's really saying, come on, if you've got any courage, you'll leave your little protective fort and come and fight like a man. Finally, Flaminius takes the bait. Hannibal leads Flaminius on a wild chase across Tuscany. He stays a day or two ahead, which allows him to survey the terrain and pick the most advantageous place to fight. Moving quickly, Hannibal and his 30,000 men race past the small village of Pazignano into a hilly forest along Lake Tresemene. Flaminius is in hot pursuit. The road leads Hannibal, now on horseback, through what's known as a defile, a narrow passage between the mountains and the lake's shoreline. By now, all of Hannibal's elephants are dead. And as he marches into this defile, this narrow passage between the cliffs and the lake, he becomes immediately aware of the landscape's tactical advantages. Hannibal has discovered the perfect location for his next battle. It comes with its own natural advantage. In the morning, a thick fog comes off the lake and obscures the entire valley. It's made to order camouflage. Hannibal orders some of his men to camp at the far end of the valley, in plain view of all who pass through the defile. We're told that Hannibal uh, sends scouts far ahead into the hills to light campfires. He wants to convince the Romans that he's farther away than he actually is. Still chasing Hannibal, Flaminius reaches Pazignano and sends a reconnaissance team into the defile. They come back and it's, it's, it's too narrow. There it can't, be, it can't be any possibility of ambush. The next day, around dawn, the Roman army begins to move through the defile. As Flaminius reaches the valley, the eerie lake fog rolls in once again. In the distance, Flaminius can see the fires of Hannibal's camp on the hill. Flaminius thinks, I finally got him. I've got Hannibal trapped, and it's time to tear him apart. Flaminius orders 6,000 Roman soldiers to rush up the hill and attack Hannibal. The legion double times, gets out there, climbs the hill, and smashes into Hannibal's camp. The Romans hack at Hannibal's rear guard infantry in wild combat. Suddenly, Hannibal's men turn and run, enticing the Roman soldiers to pursue. Hannibal then springs one of the deadliest traps in military history. Hannibal Barca of Carthage is about to spring one of military history's greatest traps. 30,000 Carthaginian infantry and cavalry rise out of the morning fog and smash into the stunned Roman force. The bloodbath begins. The battle rages along the shores of Lake Tresemene in northwest Italy. Hannibal's Spanish and African heavy infantry hit the Roman front. Wild Celtic tribesmen strike the center. Numidian light cavalry crush the Romans from the rear. Romans are trapped. And in this terrible, they're in line of march. They're not even uh, set for combat formation. Their weapons on out, and they're taken right in the flank by this large army, and it just slaughters them. It slaughters them. Hannibal makes two big gambles at Tresemene. First is that the fog will return to hide his 30,000 men in the hills. Second, that Flaminius will jump at his decoy camp. And he wins both bets. Out of 20,000 men, 15,000 die in about three hours including Flaminius himself. Hannibal's losses, 1,500. That's a kill ratio of 10 to 1. In one of the most successful ambushes in history, another Roman army has been wiped out. At age 27, Hannibal is already a legendary military tactician. 
In less than two years, Hannibal has handed Rome three catastrophic defeats. 2,000 men at Ticinus, 30,000 at Trebia, and now 15,000 more at Trasimene. Rome had never seen such a series of defeats in its history. In the face of this defeat, the Roman Senate makes a bold, perhaps desperate decision. They vote to appoint a temporary dictator over the military to put an end to Hannibal's reign of terror. He is Quintus Fabius Maximus. Selecting a dictator is extremely rare in Roman history. They highly value their republic, and so the idea of handing absolute power to one man isn't taken lightly. In fact, the position came with an automatic time limit of six months. Fabius raises an army of 90,000 men, the largest yet in Roman history. But he isn't going to use them in direct combat against Hannibal. Fabius is an excellent strategic thinker. He takes one look around, looks at the Roman man manpower, naval resources, food resources, the geography, and then compares them with Hannibal's small army, way from home, can't resupply, no navy. He concludes quite correctly that Hannibal can't win, that essentially there's no point to continue to try to defeat Hannibal in the field. And this becomes the famous Fabian strategy. Do not engage the enemy in head-to-head -head battle. Harass him. When he sends foraging teams to look for food, kill them. If anybody provides sanctuary in a small town, burn the place down. Fabius's strategy leaves Hannibal and his men hungry and tired. They are constantly hunted and harassed and never able to resupply. Fabius strategies were not only good, they were exactly the strategy that Rome needed to stop a man like Hannibal, whose whole tactical and strategic vision was based on fighting battles. To have a strategy that's battle-centric, you have to have an enemy who obliges. By refusing to give battle, Fabius denied Hannibal to fight the war that he wanted to fight. This is a strategy that would work, but the problem is, like all strategy, it depends on political will. It depends on the political will of the Senate to essentially continue the Fabian strategy, perhaps for three, four, five years. Well, what happens is, this is not the Roman way. Despite the strategy's success so far, the impatient Roman Senate forces Fabius to resign after six months. They return to their more typical mode of government with the election of two civilian co-consuls. Paulus and Varro are chosen and directed to defeat Hannibal as quickly as possible. Varro wants to fight Hannibal in an all-out war. Paulus, however, does not want to be lured into battle. This is problematic because there's a combination of two Roman armies. The two co-consuls, Paulus and Varro, trade off command every other day. It may sound insane, but one day Paulus was the supreme commander, the next day Varro. Hannibal is well aware of this and knows who he'd rather fight. Hannibal's strength is in face-to-face -face combat, and he wants to fight Varro's war. Hannibal gathers his intelligence, lies in wait, then sends in a strike team just as Varro takes command. On cue, Varro roars into action and sends a fighting force to meet Hannibal near Cannae, Italy. Varro's colossal army is made up of more than 80,000 Roman and allied foot soldiers and 6,000 cavalry. It is the most massive Roman fighting force ever to take the field at one time. Varro arranges his soldiers in a typical Roman maniple formation, but adds a new twist to the old formula. What they do is they pack themselves a little tighter than before so that the, the front is shorter, but the depth is thicker. Only 300 feet away, Hannibal deploys his own infantry force of 35,000, but in a unique configuration, never before used on any Western battlefield. Normally, an infantry line would be deployed straight. He deploys it in a concave bow with the belly of the bow facing closest to the Roman lines in a kind of semicircle. Hannibal himself leads the infantry force from the middle of the line. The Battle of Annihilation begins. The 
infantry battle is fierce. But it's the Carthaginian cavalry that scores the first punishing blow. Heavy cavalry smashes into the Roman cavalry with such incredible force that it shatters it. I mean, be between the dead and the wounded and the dead horses, the rest just take flight. Trying to outrun this tidal wave of death, the Romans are chopped down at full stride. It is the beginning of one of the greatest battles of all time. It's the Second Punic War between Carthage and Rome. Two great armies slaughter each other on the plains of Cannae, battling over who will control the entire Mediterranean region. Hannibal has configured his army in a unique semicircle. On the flanks, the Carthaginian cavalry commander detaches part of his force to help the Numidian light cavalry on the opposite side of the battlefield. With a nearly four to one advantage, the Carthaginian cavalry makes short work of the Roman cavalry on at the flanks. In the center, the Roman infantry drives Hannibal back. But it's a ruse. Hannibal is giving ground on purpose. And this is why Hannibal originally assembled his men in a semicircle. He knew that the center would give ground, and he knew his flanks would hold. Slowly, the center collapses, and the Romans would think they're winning and commit more troops in the center. The original bow shape of the Carthaginian line now resembles a V. As Hannibal's infantry flexes inward, the Roman units are drawn deeper and deeper into a V-shaped line. And as they go further, they get completely packed together. Pressed into this V, the Roman infantry can only move in one direction, straight ahead. Livy, one of the Roman historians, tells us the pressure was so great that Roman soldiers' arms were forced against their bodies. They could not live, lift their swords. On Hannibal's signal, the African phalanxes turn in toward the middle and crush the Romans from the sides. Hannibal blocks in front. The African infantry squeezes the side. Hannibal's older brother, Hasdrubal, uses cavalry to slash from behind. The Romans are jammed into a kill box. Hasdrubal the Brilliant now rides around in back of the Romans, hits them in the rear. This is a famous double envelopment. It had never been done in the history of warfare before. Never. And it's a brilliant maneuver. What Hannibal realized is that while the Roman army is nearly unstoppable as it attacks straight ahead, its manibles can only move forward and back. They cannot turn and they cannot envelop. And if you know exactly how your enemy is going to fight, it's not that hard to figure out how to defeat it. By the time the sun sets, Hannibal has slaughtered an unbelievable number of Romans. The Battle of Cannae was so full of death 
that it gave rise to a new term in military terminology. It's called the Battle of Annihilation. The Battle of Annihilation. The enemy wasn't defeated, it was annihilated. Kenai ranks as one of the deadliest and most brutal battles in history. More than 70,000 Romans are butchered in a single day. 70,000 dead killed in an area only twice the size of Central Park. Ask yourself, this is an age before mechanical weapons. How long does it take to kill 70,000 human beings with swords and spears, one at a time? The answer seems to be about six hours. Hannibal is on the verge of realizing his dream of Rome's destruction. But the victory at Cannae will actually mark the end of Hannibal's military success on the Italian peninsula. After the battle, the commander of the Numidian cavalry, Maharbal, urges Hannibal to march immediately on Rome. But Hannibal refuses. This leads Maharbal to exclaim, Hannibal, you know how to conquer, but you do not know how to use your victories. Hannibal might believe that Rome will finally bow before him and surrender after their devastating defeat. Or maybe he realizes a siege of Rome will be impossible to maintain without reinforcements and supplies. Cannae is about 260 miles away from Rome, so he gets close, but not close enough. Whatever the reason, the destruction at Cannae is the closest Hannibal ever gets to fulfilling the blood oath of revenge he made to his father. Hannibal does try to negotiate a peace deal with the Romans after Cannae, but the Romans refuse. In fact, the Romans actually outlaw the word peace. No citizen could ever consider it out loud. Ultimately, the Romans decide to return to the Fabian strategy of containment. Instead of trying to beat Hannibal on the battlefield, they will try to outlast him. Think about this for a minute. Rome, with all their imperial destructive ways, says, you know what? We can't beat this guy. We can only harass him. We can only contain him. Hannibal was able to get many of the southern Italian towns to defect to him, so he was able to live off the land. But try as he might, he can never fulfill his oath to his father. He never burns Rome to the ground. For all his triumphs on the battlefield, Hannibal's campaign must be seen as a failure. He eventually abandons his quest to destroy Rome and sails back to Carthage. Well, to think about a more modern example, you could look at Robert E. Lee. During uh, the American Civil War, Lee won nearly every one of his battles, but uh, ultimately lost the war. No matter how many battles you win, the ultimate goal of a battle is a means to an end, to win the war strategically. From that perspective, Hannibal's campaigns were a failure. The individual battles were victorious, uh, but the strategy of bringing Rome to heel and, and making it sign a peace treaty it failed. Uh, you don't get any points in warfare for trying. The greatest irony of Hannibal's invasion is that it sets in motion the events that will turn the Republic of Rome into an empire that will conquer the ancient world. Had there been no Hannibal, had there been no Second Punic War, there's no reason to suspect that Rome would ever uh, have expanded to the degree that it did. Hannibal's tactics and stealth, his bloodlust and determination, his savagery and genius are all taught to modern military commanders throughout the world. But the greatest lesson might be that while Hannibal could annihilate the armies of Rome, he could not ultimately destroy Rome. <laughs>